Yeah. Oh, it says she's reconnecting. Okay. Hi everyone. I just want to make sure that you can see me and hear the that you can see see the video and hear me. Um, if you can, go ahead and let me know in the chat box so we know that we're broadcasting. Okay. Ah, oh, perfect. Mm -hmm. Looks good. Awesome, thanks everybody. And um, as we're waiting for our second presenter to connect here with us, uh, where's everybody coming from today? Where are you connecting from? We're curious. And as new folks are joining us, let us know where you are. All right, so we have some folks in Canada, Nebraska, Maine, Pennsylvania, Iowa, Georgia, and State, Florida, Boston, Texas. Folks are coming from all over. That's terrific. That is awesome. Invite Melissa one more time, see if we can get her back. We had both of our presenters and then one of them disappeared. <laughs> it's like magic. <laughs> it is. All right, if you're just joining us, we're just checking in about where everybody is signing in from as we um, get our final prep together here. There we go. We're back. <laughs> All right, we've got some folks coming from North Carolina, Michigan, Colorado, California. Excellent, just from all over the place. Well, I wanna thank you all so much for joining us today. I am so excited um, to talk with you a little bit about designing a motivational syllabus with our guests, Melissa Thomas and Christina Harrington. I am Katie Linder, also a stylist author, and it is my pleasure to host this series and get to chat um, directly with our stylist authors about the topics of their books. So if you have come to one of these before, you might know how this goes. Um, I'm gonna ask some questions myself that I've kind of prepared in advance, but there is a question and answer feature down on your screen at the bottom, and you can ask any question you want. Um, it's great to ask it through that feature because then I can timestamp the answer in the video for people who watch it later. So um, please feel free to ask a question there, or if you wanna drop it into the chat, you can do that too, and I'll move it over there. There's also a button at the bottom of your screen where you can click and learn a little bit more about Christina Melissa's book. Um, now, if you have not seen it yet, it looks like this. It is called Designing the Motivational Syllabus. Mm -hmm. um, it is part of the Excellent Teacher Series, uh, which is a, a wonderful series that Stylus has put together. Um, so I'm excited to dive in, learn a little bit more. Christina, Melissa, why don't you both say hello and we'll test your audio too. Christine, you wanna go first? Sure, so hi everyone, delighted to be here. Really excited to have this conversation today. The syllabus is uh, you know, one of the areas that I get really excited about talking about. So um, thanks so much for joining. Hi, I'm Melissa Thomas and I'm also excited to be here and I'm from Austin, Texas. Um, and so, and I can't wait to share a little bit about the book and um, what motive it is to write it, um, but also kind of how you can use it in, in your, you know, how we can use the syllabus more effectively, so. Awesome. Okay, so let's dive right in. So the first question I have is just, why is the syllabus such a key component of motivating students to learn? And this is the title of the book, how we can use a syllabus to be motivational. Christine, tell us a little bit about that specific component of the syllabus. Sure, I'd be happy to. Well, I think that um, the syllabus is often the very first introduction that students have to a class. In fact, many of us send the syllabus out via email or it's posted online. So before they even get to meet you as a faculty member face to face, they often are getting introduced to both you and your course through the syllabus. So it is, as we all know, first impressions matter. Um, and it's a really critical document right from the start. And just like any action or any, um, 
you know, any, anything that we do as faculty can either motivate or demotivate our students. So I think that I certainly have seen students get really um, kind of traumatized sometimes even by syllabi that are really, um, you know, overwhelming and perhaps very negative in tone um, and, and certainly aren't very excited about starting the semester. And I've also seen students on the opposite end, which is what Melissa and I are trying to encourage folks to do, to really get um, excited about the course. So it, it, to me, I think the syllabus is an opportunity to invite students to your discipline, to share your um, passion really for the, the material that you're going to be covering, and to start to build a professor-student relationship, you know, by telling them a little bit about yourself, sharing a photo, all of those kind of start to personalize the class, because learning is a very social experience. And I think that the syllabus is probably a really underutilized document. And if we we um, leverage this document to try to start building that relationship from the start, um, we can really engage our students. So um, I really think it's pretty amazing at how much it can do. And I think sometimes we're so ho-hum, let me go change my dates. And you know, it's time to you know switch it for this semester. And we don't always step back and, and really um, embrace the opportunity that, that lies ahead of using this document in a way to, to really engage and get students excited about the course. Okay, so this is a great introduction to this topic. I think one of the things that many of us have heard about syllabi in the past is that it should be a kind of contract. And you had mentioned students being a little bit traumatized <laughs> sometimes by this document. And I wonder if sometimes that trauma, you know, that trauma comes from this idea of it being a, a contract and it feels kind of very heavy and, and they're concerned about that. Um, Melissa, I know this is something you kind of think about, we should get rid of this notion of the syllabus as a contract. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and why this is maybe not helping students to be motivated in the way that we might want them to be? No, it's not doing us any favors. Um, so I actually have a law degree. So my background, I have a legal background. And so when I first heard this like notion, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, let's step back, you know. Um, one, legally, it's actually not a contract. So that's really important to know. Um, but the courts have said that if we continue to call it a contract, they might in turn treat it like a contract. And that actually is a really slippery slope. Um, we don't want it to be a contract um, because if you for instance, decided to change the dates of a test and you didn't have some kind of disclaimer on there, you could it, it could end up being a really big problem for you. But the bigger issue is, is that when we treat the syllabus like a contract, it puts us on adversarial sides, right? It it starts to create this adversarial relationship with our students where I'm on one side and you're on the other. And by goodness, you better do this or else, right? And so it creates a relationship that we don't really want, right? We know that learning is socially constructed and we know that in order to do that, we have to create environments in our classroom where we're gonna journey in this together. And by putting ourselves on either side of this document, it's a really bad precedent that we're setting inside the classroom. And so when we have students who, yeah, the us versus them, exactly, Brett, like that is, I mean, that's the issue, right? And we don't want an us versus them. We want to, we want to we, and we are going to do something and we're going to learn this together and we're going to journey together. So I think that the contract concept, it's flawed, it's incorrect, but it's also just not helping us. And it's not setting up the kinds of relationships that we want to build. And I've seen professors go so far as having students sign it like a contract. And I mean, that's, we, we don't need to do that. That's not the kind of environment that is going to help students be motivated to learn and want them to do well in our courses. Katie, if you don't mind, I'm going to just um, jump in for a minute because I think that um, I don't know anyone who's gotten excited about reading a legal contract, right? <laughs> so, you know, if you start to phrase it more as a contract, it almost immediately demotivate students. So I think that that's a, it's a surefire way not to engage your students if you want to view it a, as a contract. And I think that also just adds to it being problematic. But I think the reason why faculty have kind of leaned toward that language and that's very widely used. I mean, Melissa and I, we go around speaking on this topic quite regularly. And when we ask what the purpose of the syllabus is, almost every single audience is going to say contract. Um, but what I think they really mean is 
is it's a way to set expectations. And I think that has a lot of value. And, and Melissa and I really spend a lot of time talking about the importance of transparency with the syllabus. And it is critical that we're sharing, uh, you know, what is going to be expected of students, what students can ex be expected uh, uh, from us, you know, so really kind of that mutual um, connection. But sharing expectations doesn't necessarily mean contractual. So um, I think that's kind of important. So Christy's made a great comment in the chat about how she always shifts things around because things are happening for her, for her students. And this idea of the contract, it also kind of limits you to feel like you can't make a change and you're you're really mm -hmm. stuck in a certain thing. And so I, that flexibility, I think, is probably pretty key as well. And, and I would guess that al almost always when we make those changes, they're in the favor of students. You know, usually it's extending a deadline. Like we would never suggest moving deadlines up, you know, or anything that would be opposite. But giving students more flexibility, um, you know, kind of readjusting things and saying, you know what, I don't think you're quite prepared yet for this um, big project. I want to do a little bit of more groundwork in class to make sure you're going to be successful on it. I think we would all agree that, you know, usually those changes are very much student centered. Okay, so we are already getting some questions in from the audience, which is excellent. We also had some emails in advance. We're gonna turn to those in just a second. If you have questions and you're watching, please feel free to use the Q&A feature. You can also vote up questions that you think are really interesting. So I wanna ask a question first though, to kind of get into the nitty gritty of this. I think a lot of people are really curious about how long a syllabus should be. So what do we know about length? Because this is one of those things that you just kind of keep adding things. Our institutions want us to add things. Like mm -hmm. it just becomes kind of a laundry list and we throw all this stuff into the syllabus. So how long should a syllabus be? So this is a question that I um, really wanted to know the answer to. So, um, you know, cause I, Katie, what you just described was starting to be very much what my syllabus was looking like. It was getting longer and longer and longer. And, and all of the information that I was adding was intended to be helpful to students, you know, providing more clarity on assignments or policies or whatever it might be. Um, but at the same time, it becomes more lengthy. And I think the worry is, is that if, if it becomes too long, will students get overwhelmed? Will they even read it? Um, is it useful anymore? So I dove into the literature and I, and I there are not a of studies in this space, but there are a few. Um, and the few studies that do exist, um, there were there was one, for instance, that looked at a two-page versus a six-page syllabus. And they wanted students to kind of share their perception of the course and which one was perceived to be um, better. So it was kind of an empirical study, you know, where students were arbitrarily looking at syllabi. They weren't connected to the um, specific courses they were taking, but they were just reviewing the syllabi and providing um, information about what they thought about the professor and the course. And and in every instance, the six page syllabus um, won, you know, versus the two page in terms of having more positive perceptions for the faculty member and also the course. So that kind of lended itself to the idea that providing students with more detail was something that they wanted, you know, and, and adding that really had value to them. And they actually perceived the professor to be more caring and motivated and all things um, like that because they did that. Um, now, for me personally, my syllabus was, I'm like, six pages, that's short. You know, mine was starting to get much longer than that. So I wasn't sure whether or not, um, you know, at what point is the tipping point where you've really kind of lost your mind and you're not helping students anymore. So because there was no study that really went beyond the six page, I conducted my own study with a colleague of mine, uh, Crystal Quillen, at Middlesex County College. So this was a study conducted with community college students. And we compared a six, a nine, and a 15 page syllabus. And mm -hmm. if anyone wants to, to check out the actual syllabi that were used in this um, particular study, they can visit um, my website, which is scholarlyteaching.org. Um, all three sample syllabi are there. So we did an experimental study where students were randomly assigned to you know, different conditions of the small, medium, and long syllabi. And they had to answer some questions very similar. You know, what do you think about the course? What do you think about the professor? Things of that nature. And the nine and the 15 page syllabus were viewed more positively than the six page syllabus by students. So again, they thought the professor was more caring and more motivated. Um, we then asked students in a focus group, Katie, and this was kind of interesting because we then asked them, would you prefer a syllabus that puts everything in one place where you have all of your rubrics and assignment details? So that's really what the 15 page syllabus did that the nine page one didn't, was it had all those very specific things? Or would you rather, 
get the front end now and get the syllabus, I mean the assignment details later on when it's uh, more timely and relevant to when you need it. 66% of the students said they prefer it all together. So what we heard from students was that every professor sets things up differently and they're constantly fishing like is there a rubric or is there not and am i looking where am i looking for this rubric is it in the syllabus is it in the learning management system somewhere so they were getting very frustrated by everyone putting it in different places and so the feedback that we got was having this longer syllabus knowing that all the key information that they really needed was there was important now i would say that um you know the other 33 percent did not like that you know <laughs> they did not want it so you're certainly not going to please all students Students, um, so you need to try to find some different approaches that you might want to use. And I think that the, what's most critical is how you present the syllabus. I tell my students, I have no desire for you to read my entire syllabus today. It's a 15 page document. Um, it is a resource, just like I don't expect you to read the entire textbook today either. You know, By the end of the course, you're going to look at both of all of these and the components. But what we do in the beginning of the semester are some activities that really get them um, aware of what kind of information is in the syllabus and then throughout the term we'll go back and we'll revisit it so when that paper is approaching I'll be like look at page 10 to 12 there's the specifics on this particular assignment and let's talk about that so I, I would say to you that longer is okay um, you know I don't know if you go more than 15 there's no studies out there you know so I'm not sure some people have course manuals and we call it different things course outline syllabi things of that nature but the idea of having it all in one place I think is really critical um, and an important one um, and again that was um, you know the student voice what they wanted okay so I'm going to turn to some of the questions from our audience because um, they are coming in and they're great so one is a clarification question I think based on what we were saying a little bit earlier about flexibility um, someone said our syllabus is an official document approved by the college and must remain intact so when you're talking about a syllabus what are you talking about and I think that might be referencing when we were saying if you make any changes or, or those kinds of things are you thinking that the syllabus itself would be changed midterm or that you might just adjust things in the course and not necessarily change the syllabus? Yeah, I think that, you know, I've, I've definitely, um, I've had syllabi that have to be approved and then are posted. Um, and so generally for me, the things that might change would be like the course schedule. So when certain chapters are going to be covered, maybe, you know, it took us too long to get through a certain chapter. So for me, the course schedule might be shifted a little bit or when an assignment is due, it might be shifted. Um, but the the core meat of the, the learning objectives and the things that we're going to accomplish in the course, those aren't going to change. Um, in the middle of the course, for me at least. I don't, Christine, I don't think for you either, right? Yeah, I mean, I think mostly when we say things are changing, it's usually the sequencing of um, activities, you know, the, the flow. Um, but but you bring up a good point, Katie. I think the language here, you know, having gone to so many different colleges and universities to talk about this, it, it's amazing to me how we do not have uniform language, you know, consistent language that we're using. So if someone calls something a syllabus, somebody else calls it a course outline, and other people are calling it a course manual. I mean, there are so many different versions, and some people are like, well, that's not in my syllabus. My syllabus is just the um, college required pieces. And then my, you know, kind of um, course outline and assignment details, that's it, it, that's different and it's in my LMS. Well, I, I think it really depends on what you're saying. So to Melissa and I, we're viewing it kind of as a more big package because we're trying to talk about transparency. So one of the key things that I think is most important in, in using your syllabus is to, to share what is this course all about? So those learning outcomes that Melissa just mentioned, and then how are we gonna know whether or not those outcomes were achieved, which really then translates into their assignments and and activities and then how are we going to help you get to that and that's the teaching activities and what they can expect so is there going to be group activities is there going to be lecture or combination um, online activities inside outside of class things of that nature so Melissa and I like to view it as a as a larger document but we recognize that some of you have different uh, terms that you're an institution that you may need to follow Okay, and I, we're also seeing some notes in the chat here too about how standardization of syllabi can be more common in certain areas where you have accreditation or professional schools or things like that. So there's definitely going to be shifts um, also based on discipline. 
Um, can okay. You, can, if you don't mind, I just want to jump in real quick to you about the standardization because I, I have met a lot of very frustrated faculty feeling kind of, um, you know, very confined by the standardization and feeling like they have no control over these documents. What I, what I, what I do in this situation is I do two things. First of all, I try to empower them to take the research and the information that Melissa and I have outlined in the book to back to their college so that they could at least make the standardized version better, you know, like to try to implement implement what we're going to be talking out, uh, about throughout today's webinar into the standardized um, version. And second, um, even if you can't do that, sometimes you need to include that, but maybe you can include a cover page that's much more inviting. Um, you know, so you might be able to do that. And you may even be able to say, you know, as Melissa and I would get to the policy conversation a little bit later, probably. Um, you know, here are the institutional policies. So they can kind of separate the you and the professor from the, you know, more, uh, you know, institutional language. And I think one of the things that I always talk about is inviting you to challenge the policies. So asking why, why we have certain policies, why couldn't it look like this? What if we did something like this? And I've had good success at several institutions at being part of that change process and um, getting certain things standardized that need to be standardized, like accommodations language or having the learning center mentioned and all of the syllabi so that students understand the supports that are available to them. Um, so I think that you know, the being that annoying kid that always asks why, 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 I think has paid off for me um, in terms of I'm willing to take that and I'm willing to, you know, um, have discussions about that on a grander scale. And I think that, you know, I would encourage people to do that as well, especially after they've taken a look at the book, they'll have kind of a, a better sense of, you know, where we think the fight might be worth it or not. <laughs> Okay, so another great question that came in. Um, you mentioned activities to help students get familiar with the syllabus when introducing it as a research on resource on the first day. Can you give an example of one of these kinds of activities? Um, sure. Do you want me to start, Melissa? And then if you want to yeah, add another, yeah, okay. So I, I love my favorite activity with the syllabus is the jigsaw classroom activity. So um, what I do, if you're not familiar with jigsaw classroom, I'll give you the very brief version of it. But if you Google it, you'll find plenty of um, video explanations and all. It's basically putting um, students in groups. So I might do that in groups of maybe five. Um, and that group's called a home base group. Then those five are dividing up the different pages of the syllabus. It might be the first three, you know, then page three to six, page seven to nine, et cetera. So each person in the group would get a different page, you know, section of the syllabus, page number to review. Then what you do is all of the page one to three folks, they all, so you leave your home-based group and you go over to the one to three group now, all of the folks that need to do that, what they're now doing is they're looking at page one to three and they need to determine what are the key elements that are in these pages that I want to bring back to my home base group because it's going to be my job to orient them to what kind of content is in these pages so that they know. Um, so you, they spend maybe 10 minutes or so and during that time I'm walking around, I'm making sure that they're extracting the key. If they miss something important, I'm like, whoa, why don't you look on page four right here? Take a peek and see what that is. And then they all go back to their home base group and everybody gets a minute or two to share their highlights of those pages. And I have found that this accomplishes several things. A, it's a fabulous icebreaker that we all need to do anyway, but it's content related to your course. So it's not like, you know, the toilet paper ones or the M&M ones where they're just kind of random. Um, and B, now they know how to do the Jigsaw Classroom, which they will be doing again in my class. So now they know how to do that. And C, I didn't have to tell them anything about the syllabus. There was no like, blah, blah, here's the syllabus. But they are very familiarized with what's in it. And then the key is, is not to just do that on day one, but to have them bring that out and revisit it throughout the semester with different activities. Okay, well, I think we're all probably really curious about the toilet paper one and the M&M one or these other things you've mentioned. Um, this is not the topic of today's webinar. So you can contact our, our speakers separately if you want to know about those things. Um, but um, Melissa, do you want to add in your favorite activity for this? Yeah, so one of the things I do is um, because I teach freshmen, first semester freshmen, so I will have them and um, we do a little icebreaker, but it's not toilet paper or M&Ms. But what I do is I have them I meet someone new and they share something interesting, like what did you do this past summer? And then they answer a question about the syllabus, which kind of requires them to like dive in. So they kind of take their syllabus with them and they're moving around the room and they dive in. And then I ask for, you know, 
okay, give them a minute to figure it out. And then I'll ask for a participant and then we'll switch again and they'll introduce themselves to someone new and dive in and find another piece. And so that's helpful because they're moving, they're getting interactive. It's not this boring syllabus day that I've heard about uh, on campus and where they're given the syllabus and then they go home. Um, but I'm really expecting them to engage with the content. And then the other thing I added this last year was with um, the learning objectives. I actually made a chart where they have to then um, fill out what activities and assessments tie back to the learning objectives. Because I think that that's a piece of the syllabus that they forget about and they're like, they don't even know why that's important to them. And so um, by having them do that activity, it really helps them understand like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to get out of this course and this is how I'm going to learn it and this is how I'm going to show that I've learned it. And so I think that's really helpful. Um, but again, like I wouldn't do that on day one. Like I would probably have them bring their syllabi back out like the next week and we would talk about that. So I know someone had emailed a question about like using it throughout the semester and really like like Christine said, pulling that syllabus through so that we're constantly referring to this document. It's not just like a one and done. Mm -hmm. Okay, so questions keep popping in. Um, yeah. So we have someone asking, we have several people kind of talking about required information for the syllabus that makes it kind of lengthy. Um, some people are kind of back channeling about this. Um, so someone says, if it's required information that's uniform for all courses, does it have to be on the syllabus or can it be moved to one online location and linked from the syllabus? Uh, they've been kind of working toward that. Someone else mentioned that there is a general college syllabus they use at their school that has a lot of policies. And so then the course syllabus can be very focused on the course content. What are some of the things that you've seen that you think might be useful in terms of thinking about um, all of the required information that needs to be in there? The only thing I would caution is that when you when you have it somewhere and it's on a website or it's on the LMS, especially if it's information about accommodations or information about student support, that it's really important that you draw their attention to that and that you create a space in the classroom where they know that there's a place to get help. And that because we have a lot of students coming to college who have never been diagnosed before with a learning um, difference and so it's really important that we don't hide that stuff and that we don't we don't treat that like boilerplate right and so I do think that we need to create a space and a place for that um, it might not be inside your document but it could be a, a reference back um, but then in the classroom itself I think it's really important to do that so that would be my three cents on it I don't know Christine what do you and I would say that there are definitely areas where we don't need to repeat what already exists somewhere else so I think one area that sometimes gets very cumbersome and lengthy in a syllabus is the code of conduct type policies. You know, don't do this, you're not allowed to do that. And I think there's no reason to spell all that out when it's been spelled out elsewhere. So um, I just have a, um, you know, general statement and it's positively phrased, you know, so I say all students are expected to engage in behaviors that are going to foster learning, you know, a learning focused environment. Um, and that means a poll all of the actions outlined in the code of student conduct and then I'll link to the code of student conduct so rather than saying no cell phones you know make sure you arrive to class on time and and making that laundry list I think that's a great example of a place where you can link out um, and you probably don't need to be too cumbersome because when you draw out only a couple like let's just say you put only the the cell phone or just the arriving late issue you're minimizing then the other behaviors that could negatively impact learning so I think that you don't want to treat some as more important than others, um, but rather packaging them all together. So that that's definitely something I would say. And, and I think that everyone, you know, especially the plagiarism and academic integrity issues, you know, every syllabi, you know, needs to have that information. I guess the college certainly wants that. But it is the same, you know, you, you know, for every class, except for whatever classroom level, um, you know, policies you may have around that. But the institutional piece would be the same. So to me, I don't think we need to spend an enormous amount of time on that. But rather, I like to introduce that section by talking about why academic integrity matters and why it's so important. And here's how you engage in academically honest action. So kind of supporting them. And I really like to talk about academic integrity rather than plagiarism and cheating, because when you start to put those kinds of policies in your syllabus, you are communicating to students that I, I don't believe in you and I'm going to have to set the record straight right now. I think you're going to cheat. I think you're going to plagiarize. I think you're going to come late. I think you're going to use your cell phone. I mean, that's the interpretation. And that does not do wonders for the professor student relationship um, from the start. So 
instead saying, I know we're all going to work together to promote a learning focused environment, I think is a really better way to set the stage and to emphasize why that matters. So I may even throw in a little bit of data or research into my syllabus about multitasking negatively impacts not just the student who's doing it, but the students who are sitting around that student. And it's really important that I, as the, the professor, you know, facilitate a learning focused environment. So I'm going to ask that everyone engage in positive, you know, um, actions in the classroom. Yeah, and I address that by talking a lot about how my classroom isn't, you're not going to take copious amounts of notes in my class, but instead you're going to be engaged in active learning, which is going to involve discussion and movement. And um, and so you don't really need a laptop. I've had issues with laptops before, and I'm not saying they can't have a laptop, but they just don't need it. And so, and I tell them why. And and pretty quickly within the first week, they under, they're like, oh yeah, that would be silly. You know, like I'm not sitting here stenographing, you know, what I'm learning. Mm -hmm. I'm actually doing it and learning it. So, um, so yeah, I would agree. Okay, so we have kind of a related question here. Someone says, what are the best practices for incorporating a statement of diversity and inclusion into a syllabus? We're looking at suggesting some updates in our college-wide syllabus template. It's going through an academic standards committee and they think this is likely to come up. So um, this might fall under more of the student support side of the policies and, and kind of helping students to feel included to have that learning environment. But is this something you've encountered as you've talked with other people about their syllabus? Uh, required statements? So the research on inclusion has um, some of the stuff that's in the book. I think it's Collins, but I don't quote me on that. Um, a lot of what um, he was focused on was making the um, the unknown known, right? So making our documents very transparent and helping students understand what those policies are and why we have those policies and really unpacking the academia, right? So we've got all these things that we think students know. And what we find is that a lot of students, first generation students, minority students, underserved students, they don't know those things. And so really spelling those things out is a really helpful tool. So um, I have not had any experience in seeing like a diversity or inclusion statement in the syllabus itself, but instead the language of the syllabus needs to be transformed to make it accessible and to make the classroom, you know, be a place of inclusion, um, if that makes sense. Christine, have you seen any kind of diversity statement? No, I think the approach that you're talking about, Melissa, is, is right on. I think that um, you can, I, and I have, you know, I have seen some folks say, you know, we welcome, you know, like all, all types of learners and, and students from all backgrounds are welcome. So I think that colleges and universities sometimes have those statements. Um, sometimes you see them spill over into the syllabus. But most importantly, it's the transparency that equals the playing field and helps, um, you know, kind of address some of those achievement gaps that happen because you're not leaving it to chance. You're making sure that every student's got access to all of the information that they need and you're not counting on them to infer um, or use past knowledge to be able to figure out what you're asking for, but really spelling it out. So I would say that's really important. Yeah, and I so, saw the comment, I saw the comment that had the UDL, um, mm -hmm. thanks Brett for the UDL um, quote in the, or the piece that you put in. And that has more to do with like, I would assume accommodations. And so some, some statement like that mm -hmm. obviously needs to be in there. Um, but, and that's a really nice one, by the way. Um, but I think that if we're talking about like diversity and inclusion on a grander scheme, I'm not sure that you need a statement. I think you just need to make the language, you know, transparent. Mm -hmm. One of the things that the example that Brett has put into the chat, I think is helpful with as well, is this idea of personalizing that statement. So that statement as quoted here starts, at, says, starts out with, as your instructor, I feel I have a responsibility to do everything within reason to actively support a wide range of learning styles and abilities. And that is different than saying, the college requires me to right. you know, do X, <laughs> Y, and Z, or we have to do this because of some policy or rule. Um, and I think that's kind of an interesting take on some of these statements as well, is yeah. you may be required Going back to your point, Melissa, about you may be required to include certain things, but could you push back to say, am I allowed to personalize that language so that it sounds like it's coming from me and not from a policy document? Um, yeah. And that might be something to consider as well. Absolutely. 
Okay, so more questions here. Um, someone has said, how are these long syllabuses organized for best usage by students? So when you start to add in these like 16 page and you've got the assignments and the rubrics and all these other things, what are some maybe organizational strategies that are gonna help students to actually work through this document in a way that makes sense to them? So Katie, I um, will use a table of contents in the <laughs> on the front page. And this might be a good time to actually maybe share uh, my screen. Yeah, let's give an example. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So what I'm going to do. We do have a syllabus example. And I think this is actually going to be great to kind of share this and, and see some organizational strategies and tactics. Um, we see some people in the, the chat already saying yes to the table of contents. So yeah, um, and mine's hyperlinked. I don't know. I think that. Um, I hyperlink mine so that they can, you know, easily get to the the different sections as well. So, okay. So, are you able to see my screen now? Not yet. Have you clicked on the uh -oh. share screen? I thought I did. Let me. Um, it's. Uh, oh, I see. I, I I figured out what I did wrong. Now, um, let's see. I kicked myself off earlier, so you know. <laughs> All right. So we do All see right. your screen now. Go ahead it? and walk us through. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is a sample syllabus and you'll actually, this is the same one that's in the back of the book, but this one's a little prettier because it's in color and the book is obviously black and white. Um, but one of the, the points that Melissa and I like to make is usually having an image, some kind of picture on the, the front page because that really evokes emotion and excitement, um, you know, welcome statement is great. Um, contact information. Um, you see this statement here, please reach out to me. There's actually a research study that shows if you add the, actually they say, please come and talk with me. If you add those six words from the research study, that students are much more um, likely to actually reach out to you during the semester. So um, adding those six words is one quick fix that you can do immediately to, to try to increase uh, student engagement with you. Then you'll see here, I do have a table of contents. So you can see, let me make this a little, little bit bigger. Is that better? We can see it. Okay. You can see it good? Okay, yeah. great. So, um, you know, so then I do have the table of contents and that just gives everybody a, a chance to, you know, see what what's where. And you'll see these are more, you know, the at the end, the reading assignment questions. I mean, that's really an assignment. You'll see that in a moment. So, uh, you know, the, the main part of the syllabus ends around page 10 or so, and the rest is really the rubrics and the specifics. So although this looks like a really long syllabus, I think you'll see it's organized. Hopefully you'll agree in a great way. So now I have this big giant heading. What is this course all about? And we have, obviously, this comes from the catalog. Um, here's the learning outcomes. Melissa, and I like to really use that personalized language that you just mentioned a minute ago. Um, and the, uh, you know, the idea here is, is using you instead of students will be able to so that they really see this as a document that's between um, and then kind of talking about why those skills are important. So this was for an educational psychology class. And I'm connecting it to the greater, um, you know, kind of process of being a, a teacher eventually. Um, here is just kind of an overview of the topics that they would see. And you'll see these are all chunked. Um, now, this is where I start to share a little bit about myself and why I'm so excited about the course. I also add a photo. Um, and this is particularly helpful in online classes, I think, so they can kind of get to see you. Um, now, down here, you know, I have kind of what do you expect will happen during class? So you can see uh, I'm telling them that you ever class, you're going to be engaged and involved. Um, putting a picture of the textbook can help make sure that they bought the right one as you organize the material that way. Um, Melissa and I are really big fans of making sure we have the kinds of support um, that students might need right here. And this is where we're linking. So we're not duplicating everything that the counselors or the librarians or the tutors are doing, but making them aware that these resources are available and making it easier for them to get to their specific pages rather than trying to just kind of use the, the website uh, search feature. And I do like, Christine, that you have both the phone number, the physical location, mm -hmm. and the website. So that students yeah. who want to engage have multiple ways of engaging, and they can work with mm -hmm. whatever way is comfortable for them. Yep. And then we, um, you know, we really are big fans of giving students to on how to study in some of the research and I know there was a chat question before should you be modeling what you want and you'll see we are modeling insight you know in text citations using APA format so absolutely we believe you should model that in the syllabus so you can see that outlined here um, this visual um, you know kind of image here just kind of outlines what students should be doing before during and after class so we think that's kind of important 
Um, here's an inclusion statement that was asked about, you know, where the college welcomes all students with disabilities. And if you need something, here's what you need to do to get there. Um, so that's um, the information. Um, here you'll, I'll just leave the um, academic integrity for a moment. You can see how I'm really focused more on the reason for all of this and helping them understand so they're not unintentionally plagiarizing or cheating. So kind of spelling some of that, that out for them. Um, you know, late with late and missed exam policies, register information, all that kind of stuff. Now, here's where the course outline comes into play. So um, this is where we're giving them the learning objectives for each. Um, it could be a week or it could be a day, depending on how your class is set up. So they can see and it's linked back to the, the larger learning outcomes for the class. So they see the connection between all of that. Because as Melissa said before, those dots aren't always connected without some of that explicit you know, support in helping them do that. I'm just gonna scroll through this pretty quickly because this is all the course outline part. Now, in terms of the grade, one of the things that Melissa and I love, in addition to what you see here, which is what we normally have, we also have included a pie chart. Um, and we find that this visual, uh, you know, representation of their grade helps them see how the different components are weighted um, so that, you know, they get better as their um, ultimate final grade. And if we keep scrolling around, now this is where you're gonna see, this is the details. So this is what some of you may be giving out separately and you may not view this as part of the syllabus, but based on the research, we decided to include it. So they're getting all their rubrics and all the specific information. And then this part goes on and on. So um, on page 12 of 24, but here's where they're getting all of the information that they need to successfully do all of the assignments. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop sharing so we can get back to our conversation. Hopefully that worked. Am I back on the screen? Yep, you're back. And I think that's a great answer to that question about organization, especially the table of contents. People seem to really love that. Um, okay, I'm gonna dive into some other questions that we've had here. Uh, so someone says, uh, let's see. So this was one of the questions that was emailed in advance. One of the challenges mm -hmm. I have is getting students to read the syllabus. I've encouraged faculty to add more detail. One of their arguments is that students don't read it. What are other formats aside from traditional text-based that might be better to facilitate student engagement with the syllabus? So you've mentioned the LMS before. Some people are embedding the syllabus in the LMS, especially for people who are teaching online or blended. Um, can you talk a little bit about this idea of actually getting students to read it? We mentioned the activities to do. Are there other things that you think are also helpful for this? Christine, you wanna talk about the narration? So for the online classes, what I'll do is very much what I just did with you, but in a little bit more of a comprehensive way. So kind of walking them through the syllabus, I do a narrated screencast um, so that they get all of the information um, that they hear me kind of talking about it because they don't have as much opportunity to dialogue as they do in a in-person class. Um, but in, in terms of getting students to read it, I would say, go back to why do you want them to read it? And what is your goal? So if your goal is for them to make sure that they've read the policies, then you need to, you have to hold them accountable. It's really the only way, Katie, if you want them, like just like if you want them to read the textbook, you can't just go like this and say, oh, I hope they do. You actually have to give them some kind of assignment, <laughs> you know? So if you want them to do it and there's a good reason for doing so, you either A, you make it happen during class time or B, you make them accountable for it outside of class time. So I, I'm not a giant, like there are lots of sil syllabus uh, quizzing ideas out there and I think that some of them are fabulous but sometimes they're more of a gotcha kind of quiz I want to make sure if you read every little nook and cranny well is it really important for them to read every nook and cranny like are you really kind of giving quiz questions on like minutia in your syllabus or are you helping them see the bigger picture just like the textbook I mean they don't really need to memorize every word in the textbook but they need to be able to differentiate what are the big ideas from what are the supporting um, you know smaller ideas that kind of feed into that so I think that when we say we want our students to read our syllabus, I think we really mean we want them to use the syllabus as a resource. Um, and we want them to know what kind of material is in there. And, and that's why the Jigsaw Classroom works well. But you can also do collaborative quizzing. I really like that. Um, and you could do, of course, the, you know, the, the quizzing. And that works well in an online class as well. Um, and you could use, you know, multiple times for them to get it, you know, find it. I know sometimes people will hide kind of a, a, a hidden, uh, you know, bonus point or something in the middle of the syllabus to get them excited and, and engaged and looking at some of the finer 
details, right. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it, I don't know that they need to read the entire syllabus on day one, you know, like I, what parts are really important for you to read today? I'm going to make sure that you're, I'm bringing your attention there and you're going to get that information, whether it's online and I'm narrating that or it's in person and we're um, discussing it in class. Okay. Yeah. Amy shared a great idea too, where she uses a mm -hmm. syllabus quiz, but has the students write the questions and then they exchange mm -hmm. them the second day of class. So really the idea I think is to engage students in the syllabus in whatever way this this looks yeah. like for your classroom your discipline mm -hmm. but also i've heard both of you mention this idea of just referencing the syllabus multiple times throughout the term bringing it out mm -hmm. talking about mm -hmm. it pointing to something in it and making sure that it is kind of a living document that they're not just mm -hmm. not referencing you know they're they're keeping yeah. it with them so that they can keep looking at it absolutely Okay, let's see. Um, so someone asked, for those teaching face-to-face -face blended or flipped, i.e. still seeing students in person, how many people are still handing out print copies of the syllabus? Is this something that you're still seeing as a common thing? Okay. I don't, do it. Yeah. Does it, I don't do it. I never print it out anymore. So. We're split on this. Um, <laughs> this. We agree on so much, but this might be the one thing that we are split on. And I know that some of the students are going to lose it. And that's OK, because it's there. It's on the LMS, right? It's not like I'm giving them a printed copy and then they never get to have it again. And I'm like, ha ha, you know, but I do like them to have that physical copy, mainly because we use it in class physically the first day. And I don't want them on their devices because I find that when they're on a device, they sometimes will ping to another window or screen and it. And so for me, like I do a lot on paper um, because I think we're losing a lot of that. And I think that it's not the worst thing in the world to have them with a little bit of paper. Um, so, um, and I've taught online and I, you know, I can do that. Um, but I do like to give out a paper copy, but I give out a paper copy of the front part, not of all the rubrics and stuff. And that is online. And then we refer to that and we go back to that. So my, what my printed version is, is kind of the, what, you know, Christine would say, like the first 10 pages or something. And then the rest of it is available to them as, you know, the whole document is available to them as an ancillary online document that we can then go back to and I can show. Um, but I do, I do see, I mean, I teach at UT, I see a lot of paper syllabi still. Um, and so um, I still think it's a thing, um, but Christine is well, all- I will on say that, I mean, I do think out of all the things that you could possibly print, printing the syllabus is a good one. And I certainly like them to print out like, you know, the, you know, maybe the course outline with the key dates or something. Um, you know, they may not need to print out all the policies and all of that may not need to be printed as long as they know where to reference it when they need it. Um, but I think it depends on your students. And if your students have mobile devices, whether it's phones or laptops or iPads or whatever that might be, I just tell my students they need to have the syllabus with them. I don't care if it's hard copy or electronic as long as they have it with them. And I feel like that's their responsibility to bring it. Um, and quite frankly, you know, with several classes and, and printing that very, very long syllabus, it's gigantic and very heavy and some breaking my back. So <laughs> you know, like, I think that they can be responsible for getting that, you know, it's, it's an important document. I share it and it is modified sometimes. So I think that's important to recognize. But the, you know, the truth is, um, we did not come across any studies on this to, to really get a sense of how many are still printing and how many aren't. But part of having a longer syllabus means you don't have to worry about the printing costs if it's electronic, right? So it does, it does get to be expensive. And you lose something if you're printing the syllabus out like if you see the one that I just showed you and the one in the book the one that I just showed you is much more impactful than the one in the book and to print out color copies is just not financially smart um, to do so I wouldn't do that but I think they're losing something by not having access to the color so I think the electronic helps with that as well okay so we also had a great comment um, by Shauna Lee who says uh, doesn't hand out the full syllabus and hard copy but does provide a hard copy of the course outline and printed on colored mm -hmm. paper so it's easier mm -hmm. for students to find so i think that's a great tip several mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. were um found that really helpful okay yep. so we've got a couple more things that are coming through as well um also emailed in advance i'm mindful that there might be other audiences for the syllabus for example a hiring committee a department chair colleagues which makes me wonder if there should be multiple versions of the syllabus for these different audiences. Uh, Melissa, what do you think about this? You're already saying no. 
No, nope. I don't think so. I say no. <laughs> yeah, no, because your syllabus is your syllabus. And if it should be good enough for your students and good enough for a hiring committee and good enough for an auditor or accreditation or anybody else, your syllabus is your syllabus. It needs to have it all. And so one, I think it's redundant and a, a waste of time to be creating multiple syllabi. Um, and two, just make a really good one. Make one really stinking good syllabus. Agreed. <laughs> All yeah. right, excellent. Uh, we had a comment in the chat, which I think is a good one about students being rural. So if you want to know that they have a paper copy of the syllabus, you actually literally have to hand them one. So that, that's a good point, thinking about access in particular. Uh, let's see. I think we've answered some of these other questions that are coming in through the chat. If there are other ones um, that folks want us to answer, definitely keep dropping them in. I have a couple more from my list that I think would be interesting for us to hear as well. Um, so I'm curious for both of you, maybe we'll start with Melissa first. Are there specific examples that led you to write this book, like experiences that you had, you know, what brought this about? I always love the origin stories of, you know, what have had you do a deeper dive into this? So um, Melissa, tell us about your experience first. Yeah, so um, so I have a law degree, and um, I ended up back at my undergraduate institution. I was running a program for master's and doctoral students, and um, they said, "Hey, you know, do you want to teach a freshman seminar?" And I was like, "Sure." And uh, and so they had a syllabus, and so I took this syllabus that someone gave me, and I taught with the syllabus, and it was awful. It was the most painful semester of my life, um, and I did a really good job hiding it because later I told the woman who was in charge of the course, I was like, "Hey, that was." terrible. Um, I, it, it was terrible. And, uh, and I never took a course on teaching, right. And how to do this, you know, but I had been an SI leader in undergrad. So I thought I knew, that, you know, how I could do this. And I will say that through a lot of research, a lot of asking for help, you know, that syllabus, I was able to take ownership over it and make it much better over the subsequent years. But Christine and I met um, at a FYE conference. I was doing a workshop on motivation in Inside the classroom and then I went to another workshop she came to mine and I and then I went to hers and at the end I was like hey you and I are talking about the exact same thing and why don't we talk about this together so we started presenting and talking about motivation and how to create a classroom that has a lot of motivational constructs and one piece of that was the syllabus and so that got us thinking hey there's not a lot out there about this, right? There's not a lot of research. Um, there's definitely not a lot in print out there about the syllabus and how to construct a great syllabus and what that can do for you and your students in the learning environment. And so that's what led us to do this. So, uh, and it's been fun. We've been um, co-presenting and co-writing now for, I don't know, it's been a long time, seven years, I think. Yeah, for sure. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Long time. yeah. 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 And, and I would just echo, I mean, you know, Melissa kind of shared our story together. Um, but what brought me to, to first, you know, thinking about the syllabus and motivation really was also teaching in that first year seminar course, because one of the assignments that I had uh, would always give my students was to help them kind of see the big picture of their semester. I'd ask them to bring in all of their syllabi from their other classes. And we'd try to help them with prioritizing and getting the big sense of what is it that you're A, going to be learning? Could they even figure out what their learning outcomes were in their other courses? And then B, what kinds of assignments they had to do to, to kind of demonstrate that they accomplished that. And when I saw these syllabi that were coming in from so many different faculty, I was quite honestly appalled at what was out there. I'm like, I can't believe, I mean, some of them were like a half a page with no information. Others were like rules, don't do this, don't do that. Like, get, you know, capital letters, exclamation points, like shouting and yelling and, you know, really kind of negative. Um, and I, and I was like, we have to do better. Like, this is not this is not okay. Like this is not helpful to our students. And no wonder why they have no idea what to do because we're not telling them, you know, we are not creating that really transparent path that Melissa and I are very focused on. I mean, we strongly believe we can create a learning path for our students, but it shouldn't be a mystery of how to get there. We should be providing that guidance. So by seeing the, um, kind of, you know, not so wonderful syllabi out there was a big motivational strategy. And I have to tell you, you know, Katie, I, I've been presenting on so many different topics related to teaching and learning recently. And 
The syllabus one is probably one of the most rewarding ones. And I will get, you know, faculty who attend my workshop to send me their before and afters. And then they're like, they're, you know, it's their proud baby, their new baby that they just shared. And it is incredible. And thinking about the reach and how simple this really is. It doesn't have to be a complicated, enormous task, you know, to redo your syllabus. But the before and after is in just an incredibly powerful tool. And, and when I was the teaching and learning center at Middlesex County College, one of my favorite events that we did was the syllabus boot camp in the summer. And people came in with their before and after. And it was day and night. And um, just really incredible. So very exciting. And I think that I see a lot of syllabi in the learning center. So and I would see graduate syllabi, actually. And I was shocked. I mean, and these graduate students were like, we don't know what's expected in this course. I'm like, how could you like this is so I don't think that this is an undergraduate versus, you know, that by graduate school, we don't have to spell these things out because we have a lot of non-traditional students returning to graduate school. A lot of students have been out for a long time. We've got to make this just as clear at every level of education. And I mean, those graduate syllabi were atrocious. Uh, and so I think that, you know, we really do need to do better by our students. And um, and this it's been really rewarding. It's neat to have faculty come and say, hey, I made some improvements on my syllabus and this is what I did. And or I want to make improvements. How can I do that? You know, and help them to, to do that. So and if you don't mind, Katie, I'm just going to jump in one more time because I, I, I want to make sure that everyone understands that some of these syllabi that I was looking at that were not great were by phenomenal faculty members, you know, so they were amazing and their syllabi did not accurately represent, you know, their amazingness, you know, like it didn't, it didn't show or tell the story and the yeah. syllabus should tell the story of what the course is all about and what this experience is going to be. And I think quite frankly, it's because there's like next to end, there's like no professional development and there are very minimal resources out there. So we felt like it was a gap that needed to be filled. And, um, you know, it, it's been tremendous. I I did like a half day workshop at a, at a college and it was a mandatory event. So one of those back to school days and I had several faculty come in saying, we walked into this day thinking, torture me now. I'm going to be talking about the syllabus for four hours. Like, how could that be? And, and like, this is going to be the most deadly professional development I've ever been to. And at the end, they're like, oh my God, I'm so inspired. And I didn't know that the syllabus could do that. You know, like that is like so incredible. So I'm, you know, I think that it's a, it's a very easy way if we just support faculty to help them do it better, to increase the transparency and uh, reach all of our students. Okay, so we are in our last five minutes and like a bunch more questions have flooded in. So I, I wanna try to get through as many of these as possible. So if you can keep your answers somewhat brief and we'll, we'll try to get through as many as we can. So someone has said, curious about essential requirements in terms of accommodations language. Our accessible education services office is talking about this. Is there a baseline? Is this an institutional choice about what is included in a syllabus in terms of uh, you know accommodation language for students? Yes, the institution needs to set that at the institutional level and you need your disability services office to be in on that and probably legal as well. So yeah, you have to, yeah, you have to set that at the institution level. Okay, hopefully that's enough of an answer. Sorry for these brief ones at the very end, um, but we are definitely going to speed through these as, be as best we can. Um, someone said, has anyone spent the first day co-constructing a syllabus with their students? Can you talk at all about co-construction of syllabi? <laughs> so I'm gonna take that one. Um, I think we have to be careful about that. And here's why. Um, I know we wanna be inclusive of getting students engaged and involved, but let, let's face it, this is really challenging work. And you are the expert of your course. And it's going to take an, a lot of mental uh, power and a lot of time for you to carefully craft. And I don't think it's fair to ask students to jump in and try to do the same thing. So Melissa and I have kind of come up with ways where they can have some choice. So maybe they can decide whether the paper is going to be 10% or 20%. But they shouldn't be deciding what the assessments are because you are the experts. And you need to make sure that those assessments line up with your learning outcomes. So the overall structure 
structure of the course and the design, I think falls on the squarely on the shoulders of the professor. But there's room, you know, like, you know, if we want to do this first or that first, you know, you could get them engaged um, or how much of this, you know, do you want this to count versus that and give them windows, not like this could be 90% or 10%, but within 10 to, you know, 25, which part do you think this aligns to? I think that is fine. Um, and if you're doing an educational course or something and you're teaching them about learning outcomes, then I think there's more space for that. But otherwise, you're, you're kind of eating up the time that you need to actually accomplish those learning outcomes by focusing too much on the co-collaboration model is our, you know, my opinion. And I think Melissa shares that. Yeah, I mean, choice is definitely a motivating factor, but I give them choice in terms of the topics that they, you you know, that they get to research and present to one another. And I embed choice in a lot of different ways. But um, mm -hmm. but in terms of like the larger scale, you know, I'm definitely the, the captain of the ship on that. OK, I'm going to try to combine a couple of these questions. Somebody first asked about the syllabus boot camp. Love the idea. Can you share more about organizing that event? And I want to combine it with someone else says biggest pushbacks you get from faculty on revising the syllabus. So when you do have people in these boot camps, I'm sure there are some kind of pushbacks you're getting um, to make them more learning centered, to make them motivational. How are you responding to some of those concerns? So can we kind of squash those two together? Sure. So I'll take that since I talked about the syllabus boot camp. So um, I'll start with the pushback because I, I did this syllabus boot camp. It was a hybrid um, situation where we got together in person for maybe three, four hours in May. Then we did some online work across the semester, I mean, the summer. And then we got back together in August again. Um, and that's where we did like our show and tell and, and more reflection on the process. But they were like evaluating each other's syllabi along the way that I was having them read some of the research that Melissa and I talk about in the book. Um, and they were getting feedback from me, but also from from their colleagues throughout as they were redoing their syllabus. And the biggest pushback that I got was, Christine, you did a bait and switch here. You told us this was a syllabus boot camp and it's really a course design boot camp. And I'm like, yeah, I kind of did. <laughs> so um, because we do think it's a big, big can you make your syllabus um, more motivational, you know, in 10 minutes or less? Yes. Throw a picture on there, change from, you know, language from students to you, make sure you have positive leave framed policies, you know, absolutely. There's some very quick, easy things you can do. But Melissa and I really think it's an opportunity for faculty to step back and really think about what am I trying to do here? And is this really the right assessment or should I be using a different kind of assessment? Assessment. So it does get to the course design piece. And am I being transparent about it? So I would say, you know, the biggest pushback is, is this is an enormous amount of work and you have just ruined my summer, <laughs> you know, and but at the end of the day, if you do, you know, I always say like teaching 80 80 percent of it is planning. So if you spend all that time planning, you're going to be like coasting when the actual course is happening because you've done such a great way and you're going to get products that you're, you're going to enjoy grading more because everyone's going to be clearer about what the expectations are. So you have set the roadmap. So you're going to be happy about the outcome and it'll be a much more enjoyable process for you. OK, we have one final question. I'm going to sneak it in. Um, it says I presented a syllabi that were either positive, think Bain's promising syllabus and written in the negative or punitive way. And my freshman biology students preferred being threatened. I didn't get it. What are your thoughts on this? <laughs> OK, close us out. What 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 are we doing in terms of listening to students if they're saying, you know, I need to be held accountable in a tough love kind of way? Yeah, I think that sometimes freshmen have come. I think this is a transition point for them. And I think that they've come from a place where mom is like, have you done your homework? What if you don't? Have, let me check your grades. Let me you know, let me check. Let me check. Let me check. And so I think that sometimes when um, first semester students or second semester students are given too much, if it's too open and like we talked about co-creating the syllabus, someone said I, they don't even know what a syllabus is, you know, that might be too much. Um, and I think that um, being firm but positive, right? I think that, um, you know, and I've looked at some of Ken Bain's work as well, but I think that we need to definitely hold them accountable just because we're positive, just because we're using, you know, student-centered language and student-centered learning doesn't mean that there's not going to be accountability, it doesn't mean that there's not going to be grades and that there's not going to be feedback and, and things aren't going to be happening. Right. And so I think that that's that balance that you've got to measure. And, and we have to realize that freshmen are that transition point from being overly scripted and overly taught and overly managed to freedom. And so we've really got to, especially with freshmen, we've got to navigate that transition with them. Um, does that seem fair, Christine? 
Yeah, I think so. I'll, I'll end with one uh, quote. When I uh, My background's counseling psychology. And I remember uh, when I was in my doctoral program, I was in this practicum site and they would make us chant this. And this was for children. And I understand we're talking about adults, but I think it still very much um, connects kids want and need limits. Like we'd have to remind ourselves, you know, that the kids want and need limits. We all want to know what the parameters are. So I don't think that they, you know, and I don't know that it needs to be negatively phrased those limits, but I think everyone wants to know what, what are the parameters I'm allowed to function within. So I think that's what we do in a syllabus. We let them know, you know, so we don't want it to be too open ended. But I, I do think that you're going to get a lot more positive than, um, you know, I, I think you'll get a lot more um, motivation and engagement with a positively framed syllabus and a negative one. So I don't even know if I believe those students. <laughs> so, I, I think that it's, uh, you know, the research really shows the opposite. So um, I think that's important. Awesome. Well, we made it through all of the questions. Uh, I want to remind everyone that this wonderful book is available if you want to check it out. Um, there's a ton more information, of course, than what we were able to get to today in our hour. But I want to thank Melissa and Christine so much. This was so informative and practical, and it was just super helpful. Thanks also to our super engaged audience for your wonderful yes. questions and this great back channel of resources. It was really fun to engage with you all this afternoon. So thanks, everybody, for your time. I will send out a re play a little bit later uh, if you want to check anything out again and uh, really appreciate everyone's time today. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Appreciate it. Bye, gal.